Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This one heavily requested. I didn't really know much about it, but everyone in the comments was like, Simon, where is the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, here it is. Now, please stop hassling me. But seriously, if you do have suggestions, leave them in the comments below. But please don't be like, this is the 15th time I've posted this suggestion. <laughs> Doesn't make me more likely to make it. Though here we are doing exactly that. Please don't. In 1990, after a fairly long and tortuous process, the Hubble Space Telescope blasted into space aboard NASA's Space Shuttle Discovery. After a rocky start, during which those on the ground found that Hubble's mirrors were ever so slightly hazy and required what can only be described as giant space spectacles, Hubble began beaming back images of the universe that simply took the breath away. The dazzling, almost surreal images taken by Hubble were a giant leap forward in terms of telescopic observation. But we're now counting down to the next huge stride forward. Hubble was never designed to last forever, and what's coming next? is set to be even better. The James Webb Space Telescope, JWT, is a joint NASA, ESA, CSA, that's US, European, and Canadian space telescope still under development, but scheduled to leave our planet, perhaps somewhat ominously, on Halloween this year, 2021. This is very much Hubble's successor, and the astonishing success of the telescope launched over 30 years ago means that it has plenty to live up to. Yeah, some of Hubble's stuff, uh, Hubble took the deep field photograph, or deep space field, what's it called, where they just took a picture of just a black square of space, and then they just let it expose for ages, and then it developed, or however they do the space stuff, I guess it's digital or something, who knows, and it was just filled with galaxies, and each one of those galaxies has like countless stars with countless planets, and it's just like, whew. and then also, did, did Hubble take the pillars of creation, which is that photo with the three giant nebulas or whatever they are that are just incomprehensible number of light years long. It's just, I, I love all this stuff. While it certainly seems like the 31st of October launch date is now set, with a weak window on either side for any adverse weather conditions, the JWT has been here before, several times in fact. The telescope was first slated to depart in 2007, and then 2011. 2014, and lastly 2018. This is the most complex telescope we've ever launched into space, and very few would doubt that when it's finally up and running, it will be a tremendous success. But it's been a long and difficult path for the JWT. Early planning regarding Hubble's success began in 1986, even before the first telescope had left Earth, with various options and varieties discussed, including the High z a 4-meter aperture infrared telescope, which would have orbited the Sun at a distance of 3 AU, 1 AU being the distance from the Earth to the Sun. But things didn't really get going until 10 years later, with the Next Generation Space Telescope, NGST, before being renamed after James E. Webb, NASA's second appointed administrator, between 1961 and 1968. The 1990s saw a series serious curtailing of NASA's budget. Well, it was still in the billions of dollars sphere, but certainly fewer billions of dollars. Faster, better, cheaper became NASA's unofficial mantra, and what was finally proposed was a low-budget 8-meter aperture telescope with a very respectable estimated cost of $500 million, which is about $862 million today. After several preliminary concept studies in the late 1990s, NASA awarded the $824.8 million, that's $1.1 billion today, prime contract to TRW Inc. in 2003 to build a telescope with a descoped 6.1-meter primary mirror. Later that same year, TWR Inc. was taken over by Northrop Grumman, with the two becoming Northrop Grumman Space Technology. By this point, the first projected launch date of 2007 was now already out of the question. Instead, NASA placed their faith in the year 2011, <laughs> still 10 years after the now date. Now that the project had been finalized and the ink had dried on the main contracts, the complexities of who would do what came into play. While Northrop Grumman Space Technology was the main contractor and would have taken care of the spacecraft, bus, and sun shield, numerous other subcontractors became involved, including Ball Aerospace and Technologies, which would build the optical telescope element, the OTE. Northrop Grumman's Astro Aerospace Business Unit would build the Deployable Tower Assembly, the DTA, and the Mid-Boom Assembly, the MBA, and lastly, Goddard Space Flight Center would be responsible for for delivering the Integrated Science Instrument Module, or ISIM. Okay, so I know that 
most of that is just not making a lot of sense right now, but we'll go into more depth regarding these components a little later in the video. This was simply designed to give you an overarching view of just how complex building the greatest telescope ever was going to be. But believe me, nothing I can really say could describe just how complicated this was all going to be, because once the contracts had been distributed, only then could the hard work of actually designing this telescope truly begin. The challenges surrounding the construction of the JWT were already enormous, but when you take into consideration that some of the technical elements to be included on the telescope have only really reached maturity in the last two decades, well, we begin to see why things have taken quite so long. In January 2007, seven of the ten technology design items included in the original design passed a non advocate review, which is essentially a review process of an already approved program or project in order to mitigate risk. This meant that they had reached an acceptable maturity, which in turn led to an acceptable diminishment of risk. In April of that same year, the Miri Krah cooler also passed its required milestone, which effectively pushed the program into the detailed design phase, and in March 2008, the project as a whole passed its preliminary design review, and a month later, its own non-advocate review. Oh my god, that's a lot of approval in reviews, which is good, I guess, because you definitely want it to work when it's up there, unlike Hubble, which was blurry. <laughs> but still, things were not quite ready across the board. The Integrated Science Instrument module passed its review in March 2009, the Optical Telescope Element in October 2009, and the Sun Shield in January 2010. More reviews! This was then followed by the Mission Critical Design Review, because of course it was, in April of 2010, after which the anticipated launch date was pushed back to 2015, or at the latest, 2018. Spoiler alert, <laughs> didn't happen. But the good news was that the JWT now seemed finally on the verge of completion. It's one of those strange twists that the designing and reviewing of a giant space telescope takes significantly longer than actually building one. The construction of the all-important mirror was done by robotic arm between November of 2015 and February of 2016, while the JWT as a whole was completed by November 2016. Hopes of launching in 2018 were dashed when the Sun Shield ripped during a practice deployment and the Sun Shield's cables failed to tighten sufficiently. An independent review was carried out that found a potential 344 single-point failures. So it was clear there was plenty to do. 344 things to do. The mechanical integration of the telescope was completed in August of 2019. And just to give you a reminder, they were hoping that this would be done back in 2007. As of March 2021, the JWT is finished and it's undergoing final testing. There is now a growing optimism that this much overdue and vastly over budget project is finally nearing its departure date. And talking of budgets, remember I said back in 2003 that the project had an estimated cost of $824 million, which is about $1.1 billion today? Well, in the 18 years since, that figure has grown by almost 10. In October 2009, the cost of the entire project passed the $10 billion mark. What was NASA slogan again? Faster, better, cheaper? Or <laughs> something like that? <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. I'm making fun. This is extremely cool. I'm glad they spent $10 billion on it. So we already know it's astoundingly expensive and incredibly late to the party, but what exactly is the JWT? The JWT will focus primarily on infrared astronomy, which means viewing astronomical objects through infrared radiation. What? Though it will carry instruments that also enable it to see objects in the mid-infrared region. Studying the infrared region comes with plenty of benefits, but simply put, most objects in our universe are too cold and faint to be seen through visible light, but can reveal themselves through infrared. Even Hubble can't monitor these infrared bands because it doesn't have the cooling apparatus needed, so when the JWT begins operating, it's perfectly feasible that we will begin to see parts of the universe that we've never seen before. The JWT will be sent out and operate close to the Earth Sun L2 Lagrange point, roughly 1.5 million kilometers, that's 930,000 miles beyond Earth's orbit, which is equal to around four times the distance between the Earth and the Moon, or 40 times around the equator if you need something a bit more down to Earth. It's really far away. The final component of the JWT is the wonderfully named spacecraft bus, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. The spacecraft bus is where the vast majority of computing, communication, propulsion, and structural parts are located. The structure weighs about 350 kilograms, that's about 770 pounds, and was constructed mostly from graphite composite material. It measures 3.5 meters, 11.5 feet in length, and roughly 6.7 meters, 22 feet in width. 
Now we could probably do an entire video on the spacecraft bust alone, there's just too much to go into real depth with, but it does incorporate six major subsystems. Electrical power, attitude control, communications, command and data handling, propulsion, and thermal control system. So pretty much everything. Central to just about everything on the JWT is its primary mirror, a 6.5 meter diameter gold-coated beryllium reflector. It will have a collecting area over six times larger than that on Hubble, measuring 24.5 square meters using 18 separate hexagonal mirrors grouped together. But if you think that the mirror will just pop out and be ready to go, well, far from it. The assembled mirror is big, far too big to travel pre-assembled. When the JWT arrives at its destination, the 18 mirrors will carefully unfold and be delicately positioned using micro motors. In theory, once opened, the mirror will only require updating every few days to retain focus. This will be done with 126 small motors being used to carefully adjust the optics. By orbiting at the L2 point, the JWT will be able to maintain synchrony with the Earth, meaning it will remain a constant distance while avoiding the shadow of the Earth and Moon. With the use of its sun shield, it will be able to keep its operating temperature below the minus 223.2 Celsius needed for infrared observation. When I say sun shield, you might imagine a giant beach umbrella in space. We certainly did, but the sun shield on the JWT is unlike anything we've ever seen before. It includes five layers, with each layer as thin as a human hair, constructed using Kapton E, a polyamide film with its membranes specially coated with aluminium on both sides and silicon on the sun facing side. The real beauty of it is its delicate folding design, in which it folds 12 times to fit inside the Ariane 5 rocket, which will carry it. Once it reaches the L2 points, the sun shield will carefully unfold in space and hopefully encompass an area measuring 14 by 21.1 meters. The Integrated Science Instrument Module, or ISIM, will provide the JWT with electrical power, computing resources, cooling capability, and it houses the four main science instruments, which are the NIRCAM, the Near Infrared Camera, an infrared imager with a spectral coverage range from the edge of the visible 0.6 micrometers through the near infrared 5 micrometers. It will also provide information used to align the 18 segments of the primary motor. There's also NIRSPEC, the Near Infrared Spectrograph, which was built by the European Space Agency and will perform spectroscopy studying the interaction between matter and electromagnetic radiation over the same wavelength range. It principally has three main modes, a low-resolution mode using a PRISM, an R1000 multi-object mode, and an R2700 integral field unit, or long-slit spectroscopy mode. Then there's MIRI, mid-infrared instrument, which will measure the mid to long infrared wavelength range between 5 to 27 micrometers and comes with a mid-infrared camera and imaging spectrometer. It also comes with its own helium gas mechanical cooler to keep it below its temperature limit of minus 267 Celsius. Then there's FGS Neris, the fine guidance sensor and near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph. This is the final instrument and one from the Canadian Space Agency. The FGS will provide the data used to both control the overall orientation of the spacecraft and to drive the fine steering motor for image stabilization. It also includes the near infrared imager and the slitless spectrograph Neris module for astronomical imaging and spectroscopy in the 0.8 to 5 micrometer wavelength range. To say that expectations surrounding the JWT project are high would be a staggering understatement. Even I'm like, this is going to be awesome. After so much money and such a long, drawn-out timescale, an awful lot is weighing on the shoulders of those leading the project. The JWT mission comes with four clear objectives. To search for light from the first stars and galaxies that formed in the universe after the Big Bang. To study the formation and evolution of galaxies. To understand the formation of stars and planetary systems. And to study planetary systems and the origins of life. After launching, the JWT will take nearly a month to travel to the L2 Lagrange points, where it will be placed into a halo orbit. It will then begin the painstaking process of unfolding its mirrors, sun shield, and mechanical arm, which is scheduled to take as long as three weeks. At this point, a series of tests will take place to make sure that everything is functioning as it should, and then, well, we start looking. While it's impossible to predict what we'll see using the JWT, we can make some broad assumptions, most of which relate to beating cosmic records. Quite simply, if the JWT travels and deploys successfully, we will begin to see things that humans have never seen before. Perhaps the most notable will be how far back we can look in time. If that sentence left you puzzled, then just stick with me for one moment. When we look out at space, we're essentially looking back in time. The light we see coming from stars takes so long to reach us, we're seeing the past, even the light from Alpha Centauri are closer 
closest star takes four years to reach us. This means that when the JWT begins gazing deeply into our universe, it would in effect be looking back closer to the Big Bang, perhaps as close as 200 million years after the events that created the universe. The most distant galaxy we can see, GNZ 11, is emitting light that is thought to have originated from 407 million years after the Big Bang, so the JWT could half this. Our understanding of exoplanets, planets outside our solar system, could be revolutionized as we will be able to see and measure planets more accurately than ever before, allowing us to accurately image planets as little as 150% the size of Earth. Lastly, the very first pristine stars made only of hydrogen and helium, the elements made in the hot Big Bang, should also become visible to the JWT, something that has frustrated astronomers up until now. The Hubble Space Telescope was a gigantic leap forward in terms of our understanding of space and what comes next could be even bigger. The JWT is set to carry enough fuel for a five-year mission, but most assume that with the right kind of fuel management that could be extended to as long as 10 years. No, we're not colonizing Mars or even walking on the moon, but if the JWT does what is planned, it will be one of the most significant steps forward in astronomical history in a long time, and that's in a science that stretches back nearly 4,000 years. But humans have been gazing up at the stars above us for far longer than that, wondering what it all means and what might be up there. With the JWT, we won't get all of the answers, but we just might come closer than we ever have before. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.